Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal agriculture. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at the Real Science Exchange, and we're here tonight with two expert guests to discuss the importance of cow monitoring and how far that technology has come in recent years for the benefit of the cows, the farmer, and the environment. Uh, I'd first like to introduce uh, Evin Van Riemsdyk from NEDAP Livestock Management. I first uh, met uh, Evin in Israel at the IFCN conference where she gave a presentation on dairy cow technology. I thought she was a great, uh, would be a great guest for the Real Science Lecture Series, and indeed she was. Um, Avine, welcome. Glad to have you here at the Real Science Exchange. And as is customary, what's in your glass tonight? Well, Scott, thank you uh, for having me after uh, having the joy of doing the webinar and following up on this podcast. Um, I know it's typical to have a, a good drink like we're in a bar. Uh, I have to be honest, I'm drinking a cappuccino today because I just came back from Oceania, traveling New Zealand and Australia for two weeks. And by pretending I don't have a jet lag, I might have one if I start on alcohol now. So I keep it on the caffeine with some good dairy in it. <laughs> Very well. Uh, Evine, I see you brought a guest with you here tonight. Would you mind uh, introducing uh, the guest you brought? Yeah, so this is uh, Stefan Borchardt. Um, we've met about a year ago, I think, for the first time. Uh, I joined NEEDUP two years ago, but Stefan has been working for a longer time already with NEEDUP sensors and their data. And uh, yeah, we had the pleasure of having uh, Stefan and his uh, colleagues visiting us at their NEEDUP facility to really do brainstorms with both our uh, data scientists from both teams. Very exciting. And he's now starting with the publications on his research. And uh, yeah, the last paper we just published on the webinar is very, very interesting. So I was hoping you could explain a bit more about this paper during this yeah. podcast. Yeah, excellent. Looking forward to that discussion. Uh, so welcome, Stefan. And uh, what's in your glass tonight? Well, first of all, thanks for having me and a nice introduction. So I have a classic from, from Berlin. It's called Berliner Pilsner. So it's a, a typical beer that we drink here. And um, I can prove that uh, we had some also some fantastic Dutch beers when we visited uh, Evin and uh, Niedab uh, in, in the Netherlands. Oh, there are some very good Dutch beers and Belgian beers, which is not all that far away. Um, anyway, I'll get into that in just a little bit because I am having a, a Dutch beer. But before I get started with that, I'm going to um, invite back a, a good friend and, and valuable resource to the Balchem team, Dr. Ryan Ordway. Ryan, thanks for joining us tonight. And what's in your glass? Well, Scott, I am in my headquarters office, so I am... Uh, double fisting it with a coffee and uh, my, if for those in the U.S. and the southern U.S., my Bucky's uh, beaver from the Bucky's uh, famous road stop um, mug, but it's just water today. So <laughs> All right, very well. Un unfortunately, the CEO doesn't, uh, doesn't, um, he hasn't quite agreed to letting me drink in a in the headquarters office and, yet, and, but we'll, okay. I'm working on it. So we'll get there. Yeah, we'll get. All there. right. Well, in honor of uh, Evian, I'm having uh, um, an Amstel in a traditional pint glass, which I'm customary to drinking out of when I'm in Europe. So I had mm -hmm. to get some while I was here at home. So anyway, in the spirit of uh, the pub folks, um, let's raise our glasses to Evian and Stefan. Here's to a great pubcast. Cheers. Tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit balchem.com to learn more. So, Avin, you had a terrific webinar back in April during the Real Science Lecture Series where you shared some great ways that NEEDAP is focusing on cow monitoring to improve the life on the farm for both the farmers and their cattle. I'd like, if you would, can you give us kind of a brief overview of how uh, NEEDAP is helping farmers to improve cow health and profitability? Um, yeah, so um, NEEDAP is actually a company founded in 1929, so almost 100 years being around. Uh, but the expertise really is focused on dairy since the 70s. So initially it was cows moving from a tie stall barn to a freestall barn. 
And there was a need to identify the individual animal to be able to feed it individually to its needs in the lactation stage in these concentrate feeders. And that's been developed in the past 40 plus years to adding heat detection because the animal is more active during heat, which can be picked up by the sensor. And eventually also more automations like uh, robotic milking, sword gates, uh, and also through newer sensor technologies, also having eating behavior, rumination behavior, other activities indicating health events or health deviations in these animals. Um, it historically always been to help a farmer day by day, identifying a cow, putting a software rule if she could eat or be milked, uh, knowing when her heat was optimum insemination time, or having that deviation in, in behavior to act on a cow, which might be unhealthy and needs a checkup. But now with farmers uh, having more challenges uh, and data can be key in that strategic decision making, we're reaching out more and more to other experts in in the field who actually can help farmers with more knowledge and combine all these, uh, these information dots. For instance, uh, the academics, the veterinarians, nutritionists. So how can they actually build more context around what sensor data is providing? And initially trying to connect all the dots with all these new technologies arising. So a farmer really has a full complete picture and can think longer term in their strategy towards the future. Yeah, interesting. Looking forward to digging that into that a little bit more here in a bit. Uh, one of the things I'd like to start off with during the webinar, you talked a little bit about the history of cow monitoring. And I wonder if you could kind of just kind of take us down memory lane real quick on, on how we got from where we started and to where we are today. Yeah, so initially it was a typical center just for identification. Uh, but always been a solution in a bigger tool. So a solution to identify an animal in the feeding station and the feeding station would provide feed or a solution to identify a cow in a milking parlor. And then you would know which animal is being milked if you had to separate her milk or you could combine with milk meter data. Yeah. Um, and that is then grown into heat detection with optimum insemination times and eventually with health according to. The other thing what has helped building these sensors globally is, is integrations with farm management softwares because it's really hard to make decisions on each individual technology or tool you have. And that has really helped us uh, scaling. Now, I remember back when I first got into the industry, we were uh, introducing computer feeders at the time and they were they were all the rage, right? And it was uh, all about identifying individual cows and trying to match uh, where they were in their lactation cycle or, or their size, their um, how much milk they were giving and, and then try to, to feed them specifically. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to assume that was one of the first stops uh, on the way of the evolution of, of this kind of technology. Yeah, and, and maybe it's partly also why it was found in the Netherlands. It was a very practical uh, challenge the farmers faced when they moved from Thaistel barns, where it was like 10, 20, 30 cows in a barn, and they moved to scale up to freestyle barns. And there were some metabolic problems because if you would feed the same ration to all cows in different lactation stages... And that's where these, uh, these feeding boxes or computerized feeding stations were introduced. And then there was a need to still identify that animal at that moment at the feeding station to have a rule how much she could eat at what times. And uh, so that was the first practical need to have identification of a cow in the freestyle barn. So yeah. she could still be the cow in the group, but individually uh, managed. Yeah, I was surprised to see during some recent travels in Europe that those are still quite popular over there um, and not so much here in the States anymore. Um, I'm kind of curious, the technologies that you guys have, are they, are they intended for just large dairies or what are they more, most appropriate for? So what we commonly see, it starts being introduced to dairy farms from 55, 60 cows. So any size where, for instance, uh, automated milk systems like milking robots are introduced, that's a start where a cow has a uh, identification plus heat and health monitoring. Uh, it's commonly thought that, that these technologies are more suitable for larger farms, but actually the biggest uh, return of the investment comes in smaller farms, especially on the heat detection part. If you miss a cow and if you miss one cow out of a 60 or you miss one cow out of a 200, the impact is much bigger on missing one cow out of a 60. Yeah, makes sense. 
you know, I was just kind of thinking today, been hearing a lot about uh, chat GPT, uh, artificial um, intelligence, and kind of curious, what role does AI have in your systems today? And then maybe, uh, Stefan, this is a question for you. What do you see AI playing? Uh, what role will they play in the future with this kind of technology? Yeah, so I'm a veterinarian by background. So I think our, um, yeah, our experience with large data is limited very quickly. And um, that, I think, was one of our smartest moves a couple of years ago that we hired a data scientist to make sense of all the data, uh, all the volume that we get from the sensors. And um, I think that's, I think, one of the limitations that we also see in our curriculum that most of the vets, they have no clue how to deal with these kind of data. And um, what is interesting, I think, for us is especially this um, communication with data scientists. I remember the first time I had to explain him what is a cow in heat. And, and I think now he has a clear understanding, okay, what's the physiological background uh, behind that? And, and I, said, I think also he was able to teach us some very basic elements of coding and i think artificial intelligence is becoming more and more um an issue for us because with these large um, data volumes we can apply some of these ai techniques to uh, make sense about the physiology but i think for us um usually the the biology of the cow is on the first spot and then i think we've we want to yeah make um, sense of, of these data um, and these kind of techniques can help us. So you mentioned biology. So the, the technology we currently have today is measuring behavior and then translating that into what we believe has gone from a bi biological perspective. Do you see somewhere down the road where we'll actually be measuring biology or we, will we continue down the path of measuring behaviors? Well, I think right now, if we think about these accelerometer systems, I think um, we measure behavioral response and then we translate that into something that is actionable for the farmer, like potential disease or heat. Um, but I think there are several other technologies available if we think about inline progesterone measurement or probably inline measurements of some substances that we don't know yet. So I think the future is bright and i think what we what we see today even only with these uh, accelerometer, accelerometer systems i think that most of the potential that they have is unused so most of the farms they simply have them as an alert generator for a cow in heat or a disease cows but i think uh, as we have shown in in this study that even mentioned but also in a couple other studies that there's more into it, things like estrus intensity or resumption of uh, estrus expression after calving. So I think that's very interesting area right now. And um, I mean, there are also a couple of scientists in the US uh, hardly um, working on it. So the sky's the limit. I mean, as we talk about precision as a nutritionist, um, you know, as being focused on nutrition, it, you know, we're when we talk about overall profitability on the farm right now, we're probably spending a lot of money, maybe, or losing a lot of money, either underfeeding certain cows on amino acids, on choline, on minerals, things like that, maybe overfeeding um, on some other ones. And I think, you know, as we get more of this data and can really aggregate it together and get closer to understanding that biology, it's really going to unlock the potential for precision feeding, which is better for everybody, more profitable for the producer and certainly um, healthier and more productive for the cow. So very mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah. Avine, you had uh, part of your, your presentation title was revealing her secrets. And I found it interesting that you, you talked about the fact that a cow is a prey animal and so that they're very good at hiding those secrets, right? And because they, they don't want to be, be eaten. And, and I'm curious, so what kind of, what buckets would your technology focus on in terms of what areas do you want to reveal those secrets? And I heard Stefan talk a little bit about uh, reproduction. Where else um, are you guys looking to, to monitor and reveal those secrets? 
Yeah, I would say that's um, heat shield express. Uh, that's a pretty strong hormonal uh, response. So uh, that's what you will still see when you're in the barn, given that you're in the barn. So that's where sensors really help you to find these cows have maybe shorter heat periods and finding them or maybe at times when you're not in the barn or at night. Uh, plus these sensors help with explaining when did the heat start and when did it reach a certain level to confirm it's a heat and it helps calculating the optimal insemination time. Um, so it's not really a cow hiding, but just helping you seeing our whole heat behavior while you're not always there. The secrets we're revealing is, like you say, that, that cow being a prey animal, so our instinct, even if she would feel weak, is try right to stay with the group, act like the others in the group, try not to stand out. Interestingly, because she now carries a device which tracks her 24-7, and that device actually learns about each individual animal's rhythm. So we see even in the same farm, under the same management and feeding times, Every cow kind of has her own rhythm, and that might have to do with her age, with a hierarchy, when she's eating, when she's resting, and then also when she's ruminating. So it doesn't matter what she does in the day, as long as she's very consistent, because cows are actually very nice to predict because they're so consistent. Revealing her secrets means the sensor will also pick up when her eating time, de eating time deviates, her rumination time deviates, maybe her inactivity goes up, or she shows other activity. So even though we're still not diagnosing what she has, we're just creating the indication something is off because she's having more inactive hours, she's eating less, she's ruminating less. Uh, depending then on the checkup by the farmer, uh, it can be different sorts of, of health incidences. Sometimes it means she stops eating very rapidly. That's what we see with those displaced amomasums. Sometimes only rumination goes off. Uh, if it's something maybe with her legs, she might rest more. Um, so we can still not diagnose what she has, but at least we create an alarm to uh, someone at the farm check on her because something is off in her daily rhythm. Do you see the point where we will, um, maybe through AI, have the ability to diagnose the problem specifically other than just saying, hey, there's a problem here? Well, maybe Stefan can even comment better on it because I know he knows a lot about transition disease and he's looked into different behaviors around transition disease. Um, what we commonly see is they do deviate and the patterns look pretty similar even with different transition disease. But Stefan might be able to comment more on it. Yeah, I think we can see clearly different patterns of behavior depending on the disease. So as we mentioned, a cow with a displaced apomasum has a very strong deviation, but if you think about other diseases like metritis, uh, ketosis, uh, mastitis, I think it really much depends on the severity of the disease. So if we think about the mastitis, for example, it might be just a, a, a very mild case, but if you think about something like a toxic mastitis, this is probably a very severe um, behavioral difference. But what was interesting, um, when we when we look at the pattern, so most of the time we can identify these cows earlier than the herdsman can do it. And we see, especially for um, diseases around uh, calving, um, even some of the cows, they show deviations um, in the dry period already. And I think that's really interesting if we would be able to predict which cow would um will be um sick and which cow will be healthy i'm not really sure if we right now if we are able to um yeah tell the farmer what is the disease but i think um the sensor is just a tool um that can help you but at the end i think somebody has to make a decision and has to um has to make an examination or an a proper intervention but but who knows um, what will be in 10 years? Well, right. I'm kind of thinking, you know, we've got technologies that can measure milk output. They can measure conductivity, which is maybe, you know, is related to mastitis. Maybe there's, uh, I know, some hormone detection. And so maybe as time goes on, we'll be integrating some of those data into the behavioral data and be, be able to predict that much more. So, well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask a question so being that 
you know, back on a comment about herd animals, is there, are you doing any predictions based on overall herd behavior? Because as, as you mentioned, a veen with, you know, an animal that gets sick and, or not quite feeling well and is, uh, hides her, hides her secrets, um, so to speak. I mean, the rest of the herd, I think, will normally react to that as well. So are there any predictions, predictive data now, or maybe that you're trying to gather in the future to look at other animals and see, okay, maybe they're not the ones that are sick, but their herd bait is, and it's impacting them out of, I mean, use the term concern, but as they are, you know, work as a herd, is that, uh, is that possible today or in the future? Or? Yes. So, so how it's being used now is, um, it would still depend and, and it can be a bit tricky on data entry. How do you find where this cow is? She's wearing a sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, but now it's about integration to farm management software. Is she assigned to the right pen in that farm management software? But on larger farms where you would say you have your, uh, uh, your low production group, your high production group, your dry group, as long as the cow, the data is entered correctly, she is in that pen, you can compare her to her, uh, to her pen mates. And you still need a larger group to get a conclusion. So if it's a dry cow pen with three cows, yes, she will deviate. Um, but how it's now commonly used actually on these larger pens. If she's in a high production group and, and on deviates, the dashboards will already tell you how much she deviates from the group average. So now you already know if she's the only one or if the whole group is at the same level. That can also actually combine the data points from different cows in the same group and create a group alert. And that will, might tell you something about uh, the feet being off or not being fed at the right times. Because if they go down in eating time as a group, then you know there's something else you have to change. It might not be the health, it might actually be feet management. The other nice tool is uh, on this dashboard, you can actually show how many animals are eating at the same time. And it will actually help you optimize your feeding strategy. It will tell you if there's always feed available. Sometimes on farms, we see gaps. So there's no feed in front of them between 4 and 7 a.m. Because you see 0% cows or close to 0% cows eating between 4 and 7. And then you see it spiking after 7 towards at 80, 90%, in which we in the graph can see there's feed delivered. So then that group data will definitely help you explain, hey, maybe we should push up the feed more often. We should feed more often. We should feed fresh feed. Uh, they'll stop eating and there's freedom feet in front of them. There might be something wrong with the feet. And that's where you guys are experts on, right? That's definitely where I see a role of a nutritionist to, to work with these group uh, patterns. Yeah, so I think I can add to this. I think one of the really nice features is this uh, group level monitoring. So before we always use time cam time lapse cameras to evaluate um, feeding management if we troubleshooting hurts but with these sensors i think you can you can um, really dig into the feeding timing but also probably the amount and i think it's really helpful and one anecdote that i always tell now is um, one of the farms that we work with they applied a knead up device to the tractor that they use for pushing the feed and with with this tech you can actually um tell when they move the tractor and when the feed was pushed so i think it's sometimes the farmers invent something that we didn't even think about and i think that's really really interesting for us to to use the data not not only for the individual car but also on a group level that's funny it's pretty, perhaps yeah. we should put the monitors on the on the farmers as well <laughs> yeah. yeah that's pretty uh pretty brilliant one, one question I had, uh, and this is maybe um, jump into a slightly different topic, but I'd actually, Avino's was at a uh, uh, conference in the Middle East and um, met some folks that are, it's actually a Dutch company that uh, is a lighting company. And I was pretty, uh, I, I got to speak to them quite a bit over the course of the week. And it was really fascinating to me. I mean, of course, that research has been out for a while and in dairy with, uh, with lighting and things like that. But is there any integration into some of your sensor data where you can actually look at that photo period effect with some of the new lighting, LED lighting that we're 
installing in barns and being able to capture that data along with some of the other biological data that we're trying to move towards. Yeah, at the moment, there are no practical applications, but we know it could be technically feasible, especially with more and more companies moving towards the cloud. We're moving to the cloud too. And that allows you actually to create better connectivity between smart devices on the farm. So we foresee that that fully smart barn where actually all the devices could talk to each other and that could be the future. Um, we are looking into, we have a cow positioning system and at the moment it tells a farmer where a cow is in the barn. And it's very practical for uh, robotic milking systems. There's always these few cows which don't show up. And if you have a three, four row barn and you have to find her, that's quite a long walk through the barn to find a cow to fetch her. So now it's practically being used, literally real time knowing where the cow is, finding her and getting her to the robot. But we work with different uh, universities actually and colleges who look into that position data of the cow. Does she have preferred spots in the barn? Uh, uh, what's her daily behavior throughout the barn? Is there a social uh, structure in that barn? So we can foresee those types of technology in the future, uh, being able to talk more to each other. But that's still a long, uh, long way of development to go. Yeah, I think one of the major drawbacks in the industry is the integration. So we are involved in the project where we have sensor data from an activity monitoring system. We have a sensor in several pens that's measuring light temperature, humidity, CO2, and ammonia. And then we have a camera that's uh, evaluating the condition of the cow, but also we are looking into lameness identification. Mm. But I was not aware of the problem to bring these different technologies together into the herd management software. Because I think the for the farmer, it's a real struggle if he has five different screens and then he has to come up with a conclusion from these five different sensors. So I think they want to have a simple solution um, within their dairy comp, PC data, whatever. Um, and I think that's right now, to me, one of the major issues is how we can bring these data together to uh, make smarter decisions. And I think your your example with the light is, is on spot. So I think um, really, really interesting. Yeah. I think that's where AI can really come into play, right? I mean, it's not just bringing the data together. It's then interpreting this mass yeah. amount of, of data and, and what does it mean bringing meaning to it? So anyway, go ahead, Ryan. You had a question. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I don't know. That was one, one thing is, I mean, I think we were talking about it that uh, we were together. Euro tier is, you know, the challenge I always had, and I'm uh, retired from feeding cows, but you know, when I was out on farms every day, it was, uh, you know, it was always a challenge. And this was back before we had sensors, but being able to make sense of all the data and the, and a challenge I always had is, you know, if you had a, uh, 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 you know, didn't have the, uh, a farm management team, you know, you would have the, the veterinarian who was gathering data, you would have the uh, reproductive company da gathering data, the nu nutritionist, and then of course the dairy management team themselves. And a lot of times you would never come together until you actually, you know, if you had a management team, you would come together once a month perhaps and talk about it. But by then you're not doing anything predictive. You're doing looking in the past and then trying to react to it, which usually that whatever that was, was, is, was over that event. Um, so I think I, I completely agree. I think it's exciting to be able to have something that can integrate it in real time and then provide data that is actually um, sort of already uh, sorted through, so to speak, to give, give you something that is predictive and understanding to everybody. Because otherwise you have so much data out there. I mean, it's just like our smartphones, right? You have so many different apps and so much data that most of it goes unused because you just don't know how to aggregate it into one uh, seamless event. So I think that if we can get that figured out. And I think, Scott, your, your comment on the AI will help us to do that. Um, but it, it will take a multi, uh, multi-professional approach in terms of having all the different stakeholders in the, in the science on the farm um, 
working with the dairy to put it together so you you have all the pertinent um, mm -hmm. points come together well actually it's quite, it's quite a nice bridge um to to what i've learned in the, in the past uh, two weeks in new zealand and australia we were learning there from farmers and veterinarians how they use sensor data in their seasonal calving because over there they have to actually mm -hmm. they would like to have them in calf within six weeks and uh, there is a limit to the time when they will still try with a bull eventually after AIing. And interestingly, the vets play a major role in doing data analysis for these farms. It's a service they provide. So um, uh, it's very interesting to learn from these veterinarians how they all work with a dashboard on farm. And some of them are very advanced in hiring data scientists in their clinic. They have to automate report tooling. They could include different sensors and no matter what sensor it was, the vet could still provide support with that context. Uh, so we were amazed actually how far they were, they were with working with the sensor data and pulling in so many more data points and still having a very structured way of supporting these farmers in a reporting tool or a consultancy uh, tool for, well, it's still, like you say, you're still looking in the past, but at least they can now have a very proactive uh, a strategy for for next breeding season so we might actually be able to learn from them with our seasonality to what we do here year round to make that intervention so when we think about sensor data we usually we, we use three different topics so the the one and probably the most simple is descriptive so for example okay how many how many percent of your cows were actually in heat within the first cycle after the water waiting period? And then it, it might be predictive. So a certain um, digital phenotype might be associated with the risk of disease. And then I think the third one is prescriptive. So if we see pattern A, what should we do with these cows? And I think for reproductive management, I think we are going uh into all of these uh three different levels and i think it's it's i think now an exciting area that i think different groups uh in cornell or in florida that they, de they developed so some prescriptions what you should do with cows for example that have been an asterisk within the volunteer rating pad which is some indication that this cow might be um reproductive wise a problem so so i think we are getting there but but you are absolutely right i think it's um it needs to be very simple for the farmer so um, we have to find a solution for them based on the different uh, data streams that we have on the farm yeah absolutely stefan while you have the floor um um Veen, uh shared some of your research that that you've done recently during her presentation would you mind kind of giving us an overview of what was the hypothesis or the thesis going into the research and what were some of your key findings sure so we took data from a large farm that uh, i was working with so before i joined the clinic of animal reproduction i worked as a herdsman and a veterinarian and i helped them um, develop some of the yeah, protocols for reproduction but also for transition cows and they have been pretty successful with uh with an edap system so they have a frag rate of around 31 percent and, and we were wondering if we can use the sensor data within the volunteer rating period so within the first 60 days to identify cows um, that have a problem um, to get pregnant and basically what we did is we differentiated cows into having no estrus event within the volunteer rating pit, one estrus event, or um, two or more estrus event. And, and then we looked at different reproductive outcomes. And actually, it turned out that the cows that were on estrus, they had worse fertility in terms of um, reduced pregnancy per AI, but also um, the reduced chance of getting pregnant within 250 days. And, and then we took the data from the transition um, period and all the health records and we looked into risk factors. And I think that's no surprise. So um, most of the diseases happening around uh, calving, they were associated with a greater risk for um, being an estrus. And I think that's a nice way how you can use health data from the farm, but also sensor data to identify cows um, that will be um, 
yeah, that, that will create some, some trouble in your repro program. And I think um, what I said before, I think now it's the time to think about a specific intervention for these cows. And we did a similar study on, on uh, different farms here in Germany as well, using an, another sensor system. And, and actually, it, it was the same result. So I think using sensor data within the volunteer rating period can help us identify cows um, that might be um, that might be in trouble. Is, is there any uh, data being collected with the, you, you had mentioned stuff on the um, equipment where there's a producer putting it on the uh, feeding equipment for pushing up. Is there anything with the harvesting equipment? Um, Cause that was always a challenge that, I, that, you know, I always dealt with as a nutritionist as it always seemed like the harvest crews did their own thing and didn't really integrate with the rest of the uh, stakeholders on the, on the farm. And that always created a challenge because then you would be stuck with, okay, we have a reproductive challenge. We have a nutrition challenge and it always would go back to the feed. Is there anything we can collect with this data to integrate it that if we do end up with a challenge, we can then go back and say, okay, was there something that happened right during that uh, harvest collection, maybe during the forage, forage collection that was, um, could give us an idea for obviously not being able to solve that problem because it's already an issue, but see if there's any type of trend data, um, perhaps even with the, you know, a, a person who was, who was harvesting or maybe it was the time or environment or, or something different that we can start bringing in. Yeah. So when I was working there as a herdsman, we had the opportunity to test a proof of concept, um, um, an IR sensor in the mixing wagon, which is, I think, right now, um, yeah, something pretty popular. And uh, we used uh, the Silo King, uh, and it was the first time that we compared, for example, NIR data in the TMR or in specific, specific feedstuffs. And we matched them with the data from the lab, and it was for the dry mat, it was pretty good. And we see the same technology here also for the corn chopper so they implement these nir sensors for example and i think um this is one example that where we can think of um actually having data from the um, forage harvest going into um feeding the cows but but other than that um i'm not aware i, I think there are a couple interesting uh, applications for example the um, University of Wisconsin, they developed an app for the kernel processing score. You can do it with your with your phone. Um, so I think there are several things out there that, that might be interesting. But but as a veterinarian, usually I focus more on the on the cows. But, but it's definitely always a discussion that we have when we run into problems in transition cows. So usually go back to the basics, um, including um feeding management as as i explained before so so i think a time lapse camera for me is usually uh worth more than a blood sample and i think that's probably an area where, where we see most of the of the issues happening on the farm it's not the uh, complicated stuff usually it's it's the basic thing that can go wrong Naveen, i'd like to circle back with you uh relative to uh, using this technology for, for breeding animals. Do you use this to replace some of the synchronizing programs or do you use it in as a supplement to that? Can you talk to that just a little bit? Yeah, so um, the, the examples where we see it is, is uh, it can be a tool, actually, uh, I think even on that farm where, where Stefan has done his research, we start actually with visual observation, a combination, of course, with the sensor technologies. So the sensors pick up cows in heat, uh, they confirm them, breed them, but they put a limit on it. So there is your voluntary waiting period, you're not breeding them. You can use sensor data to already understand which cows are cycling. So when voluntary waiting period stops and you can breed them, you will breed them uh, without hormones. It can also be used as an intervention actually to understand these cows are not cycling correctly and Stefan knows more about what could be done but also uh, what it is in, in that farm Slovakia is that 
they AG put a cap by saying, okay, we do allow them for natural heats, but at some point we have to use those hormones for the final cow. So after day 80, if they haven't shown any natural heats, that's when we put them on the sink program. So it depends on where you are and the cost of these programs. In countries where the cost is very high, then uh, the sensors are preferred. If the cost of these programs are very low and it fits in the management as it is right now, uh, I think they'll perform uh, very well too. So it can be supplementing each other, uh, sometimes can be replacing uh, because of cost. And I think the adoption rate of these 100% time their eye protocols as you have is pretty low here in Europe. So we don't have a lot of farms that use, for example, a double offsync protocol for the first service. And that, that might be also one of the, one of the differences is, um, I think usually when we present data from these protocols and, and we know they work pretty well, we always get skepticism and criticism from the veterinarian, but also from the farmer and, and at the end, also the consumer. So consumers are pretty critical here in Europe when it comes to um, systematic use of uh, hormone protocols. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. An example where what we see sense replacing is uh, like uh, the original tilt choking. Because tilt choking is also a way to understand cows which are in heat. However, it still doesn't tell you what's the optimum time for insemination. And the sensor does provide you the additional information when our heat started and then calculating what time is optimal for insemination. So that's where we do see sensors replacing the very labor-intensive uh, tilt shocking uh, protocols. But I think even for the herds that implement a double offspring protocol for first service, I think many of them also implement AI, AI uh, activity monitoring technology for subsequent services um, because um, the earliest time to diagnose an open cow is when she comes into heat 21 days after breeding. And there are a couple farms that use, for example, a fertility protocol for the first service, but then they use a mix of um, uh, activity monitoring system and uh, a recent strategy. Kind of changing directions just a little bit. What we learned about uh, the impact of cow parity on on behavior have, have you guys looked at that and, and any key findings so i mean i think you did a study on the uh, on the behavior around parturition between different parodies um so. yeah so um for instance what we know is is is, is especially uh First parity cows, primiparous cows, they have all different eating times than multiparous cows. So one conclusion from that study was, uh, should we enable these primiparous cows to have more feed allowance? And not that you will restrict feed another cow, but with hierarchy in the barn, does a uh, first cow have or actually does get enough feed as what she needs to have? Or if there's too much hierarchy in this group? So there's one suggestion, if they require different feeding times in their behaviors, um, could it be like a management strategy to uh, house them differently? However, it still has to fit in your management, right? That's one thing. But I think also uh, for, the, for the algorithm to detect cows that maybe are sick, I think what we try to look at is at least split the cows into first parity and uh, second parity or greater because maybe also we can fine-tune some of the algorithms in identifying um, a sick cow or maybe also a cow in heat because as we mentioned they have different behavioral patterns yeah and the All other right. thing we see is the the eating bouts you can see all their cows very steady in a group they'll make sure they eat and when they eat they'll, they'll eat good time and you can see when we create a barcode, what is the animal doing by the minute in a day? Um, because the younger cows having more restless behavior and older cows having way more solid behavior because, well, they know the hierarchy in the group. They know where the good feet is. They know where the good cubicles are. So, uh, again, there's something where these animals might be telling us more about what we're actually using at the moment. 
and can we gain some direction relative to stocking density or, or available bunk space then using this technology? Yeah, potentially. It's, it's still hard to say just out of eating time, anything on, on stock density. Um, still, we don't know the context as a sensor company. That, that, that's sometimes the, uh, the challenge there. We might see that in peak times, 80% of the cows are eating, but maybe there's only for 80% of the cows <laughs> a feed bunk space. We see sometimes an example in that webinar, a screenshot a for a robotic milker who has a robotic feed pusher too. At this farm, constantly 25% of cows are eating. Um, but that, that's optimal management in a smaller farm, which is very easy to achieve. Um, I'm a bit hesitant to say based on sensor data, you can say there was a question of webinar two, can you reduce your bunk space or adapt your stocking density? Still, we don't know what's happening in that group. We don't know if it's a restless group or a very steady group. So again, we need more data points and someone on farm who builds context with the sensor as a tool. Veen, is there any, uh, so speaking of parodies, are there any um, breed difference data that you're collecting? No, not that specifically. You know, we have background of, of the farms have a certain breed, but we haven't really specified in the different data uh, we get back. So all of our discussion so far has been relative to the lactating cow. Um, is there a use for this technology with, with dry cows? I think especially there is, and I think it's underestimated what the value of sensors is for dry cows. And very commonly, unfortunately, we see that usually the housing of a dry cow group is just outside antenna range. And at the moment, low farm since that's okay. We rather see the cow year round. And again, Stefan knows more about transition disease, but I think how a dry cow behaves can already be a predictor of how uh, easier transition will go. So we really say there needs to be more information being generated about these dry cows. And that can help her during transition. But Stefan uh, might be able to comment even more on it. Yeah, so I think when the farmers adopt the sensor system, I think most of the time what they are really curious about is that they there are already some cows in the close-up pen showing an, an, an health alarm. And I mean, to be honest, most of the time they wouldn't realize that these cows are actually sick without the sensors. So I think that's quite often that um, that they um, run into these kind of cows that have some indication of sickness behavior actually before parturition. So I think that's something that, that, uh, that we've noticed. And then um, for these controlled energy diets, I think some of the farms, they use the group level um, feeding, but also rumination behavior also as an indicator for sorting. It's more anecdotal evidence, but uh, nothing proved with scientific studies so far. But, but actually, I think that's quite interesting. So one of the farmers told me that when they have poor, um, poor quality of chopped straw, they can see a different pattern in, in feeding and rumination behavior. You know, while we're on the subject of uh, <clears throat> life stages, what about the calves? Are there any opportunities to use these kind of uh, behavioral sensors on calves? Yeah, so unfortunately, the way these sensors are designed for the cows, they don't work in, in very young calves. And that's really because cows are very stable in their behavior. And you have a context here. You have a calving date. You have um, a lactation curve, which is predictable. With calves, and I have a pretty long history already in calves, uh, that would be my wish if it would be easier to measure than I man manage them with sensor data. But they develop so quickly and their behavior changes so quickly. So from a very, uh, as again, nature uh, instinct makes that a calf tries to hide the first couple of days, doesn't move as much, then it starts exploring. Context might be different, it might be an individual hutch, it might be a paired housing, it might be a group, it might be an out of feeder. So for an algorithm, it's really hard to learn, especially when a calf changes every day and becomes uh, uh, expressing different behaviors every day, like what's the standard then? 
However, I do really like what these current outer feeders already provide. I've seen the latest apps these outer feeders provide. It's, but again, it's a lot of information. So I think there are already good sensors for calves, especially on these outer feeders. What would be now ideal is at some point where we can connect the dots as well. Does uh, events in early calf food based on maybe outer feeder data or other records being entered in farm management software, can it be connected in your first calving heifer's behavior? Can we really complete, complete that cycle? Very well. Um, kind of curious as we kind of get toward the end of this, if you look into your crystal ball, where's the technology going to take us, let's say in 2050? What does it look like? We've, we've already talked a little bit about this and, and integrating different technologies, but so what's, what's a life in a farmer, a day in a farmer's life look like? Is he just show up uh, uh, to his desk in the morning and the, and the computer spits out, okay, go do this. And uh, that, that becomes uh, a farmer's life or give me an idea of what, what you guys see uh, the future looking like. I think we, we, we have to realize we're still working with biological creatures who are in an environment. They're always subject to an environment. So I don't think with AI would be always be able to predict how a day will go or what the day would be like simply by the output in the morning. Um, I usually like the quotes from, from uh, especially actually Dutch farmers who moved to Canada and US to scale and they moved from a small family farm to a big operation and now they're managing their staff and people and they commonly say, well, mm -hmm. I don't have to manage the cows. The cows do what they have to do. It's about managing the people. So I think that Crystal ball, I think staff on farm, there will still be staff on farm, but uh, they will do more specialized work instead of having to do all the routines in a day. Uh, so it might have even a bigger effect on the people on the farm than on the animal on the farm. But, uh, that's the crystal ball, right? We don't know yeah. how smart we get. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, Stephanie, I, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think even, even if we see um the farms getting bigger and bigger i think with the sensec technology but also with other traits like genomic data we come back to um an area i think where we precisely can manage cows on an individual base i mean ryan you mentioned the precision feeding we see some parlors actually offering individual um, concentrate uh, based on specific patterns. And I think we we see this also for reproductive management that we might fine tune reproductive management for individual cows. So, so I think in my crystal ball, I, I would think that we are probably better able to manage individual cows based on their needs. Um, whether it's feeding, but also reproduction and maybe also um, the health monitoring side of it. Very well. As we kind of move toward uh, last call here, is there any big topics that we've yet to cover? You know, Stefan, what you had just said, um, you know, it's interesting what, what, what was once old is new again. You know, back 1970s, 1980s, every parlor had a grain feeder. You know, it was a very non-specific. you know, each cow would just get a dump of grain and more of it was just to get them to come into the parlor and things. But it seems like we're moving back. Now we have the data. Now we have the information. We're sort of, you know, we didn't necessarily have it wrong originally. We just didn't know what we were. We didn't know what we didn't know. Um, and it's, it's interesting as we move back towards that precision feeding that some of the technologies that we used to have are coming back, but this time actually with purpose mm -hmm. and uh, an understanding of actually what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. So it's, uh, I, I, I find it fascinating when you look at the, look at the historical side of things that so it's, uh, you know, looking yeah, in the actually, past, yeah. we can learn about the future. Well, actually, Ryan, to complete the, the observation, yeah, um, we see a big trend in the, the necessity of proper animal identification again. So at the beginning was the original question, can we identify an animal in a group with accurate identification? And it's, it's, it's very important, actually becoming more important again. And again, like you say, individual feeding, identification in the, par in the parlor, sword gates, 
Because if you don't have proper identification, you're still not being able to manage the animal individually. So it's an observation we have too. We go back with a technology which has been proven for so many years, and that's key at the moment. Yeah, and I think I just mentioned the genomic side. So what we are really also um, paying attention to is the connection of a digital phenotype, like, for example, um, asterisk expression and genomic data. So we, we just started a couple projects where, for example, we were able to show that cows that have a higher genomic merit for door pregnancy rate, they actually uh, have a higher chance to resume astrocyclicity. They show stronger astros expression. And I think the sensor data might also help us to identify new traits for genomic selection, for example, which is, I think, very, very interesting. Hmm. Yeah, great conversation. And they have indeed already called last call then. And with that, I'm going to ask you guys to give us one or two key takeaways that the audience ought to take with them today from the conversation. And Ryan, as our special co-host today, we're going to start with you. Tonight's last call question is brought to you by Niacer Precision Release Niacin. Niacin is a proven vasodilator for heat stress reduction and a powerful antilipolytic agent for lowering high blood MIFA in transition cows. Protected with Balchem's proprietary encapsulation technology, you can be sure it is being delivered where and when your cows need it. Learn more at balchem.com slash Oh, um, I think the biggest takeaway I have is I think don't underestimate technology. I think, uh, you know, those of us in the worked in the dairy industry long enough know that we tend to shy away from data until the last possible moment. We look, you know, at the, I'll say average consumer iPhones, things like that. And we think, oh, there's no application for that in our business. And I think we're quickly seeing that we may not be um, adopting things fast enough. So, you know, everybody needs to keep their eyes and ears and more, more specifically minds open to, uh, to ideas and, and things that can work. Yeah, well said, Ryan. Stefan, what, what comments do you have for us? Well, I think one, one of the major challenges right now from my perspective is integration of different data streams into the herd management software and, and create an easy solution that's applicable to the farmer and give him some actionable uh, insights. And I think, um, from a reproductive perspective, I think it's it's a it's really interesting to see how we can yeah individually manage cows based on their um, yeah digital phenotype. And I think um, I would like to see that farms or veterinarians um, yeah actually fully um, or use the the full potential of all the the data and not only that uh, it's showing a cow in heat and, and you breed her, I think there's more into it. And I, I think we are just scratching on the surface right now and, and starting um, starting to understand all the potential that's in there. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, why don't you give us a couple closing thoughts as we close, uh, close this out? Yeah, I guess I'm very impressed with uh, the research from Stefan's group. And especially how he's expressing or showing how current data points like uh, heat behavior in a voluntary waiting period is so much more value than we've been using it before. And I think it's key towards a more strategic decision making with other experts on the farm. Uh, for instance, uh, we didn't really go into it in this, uh, this uh, podcast but where you can really use those data points in voluntary waiting period, for instance, also to choose, do I want to breed or to sex semen or to beef semen? So many more strategies that can be applied, but already start looking at the data in the voluntary waiting period instead of waiting until you want to breed her. So we're very excited to learn uh, what other publications uh, you guys uh, come with. Yeah, thank you. So thank you, Avin and Stefan, for your many contributions to the industry and the knowledge on this very interesting conversation. Ryan, thank you for joining me again and helping me out. And to our loyal listeners, 
Thank you, as always, for coming along for this episode and sticking with us uh, and look forward to more topics with you. Um, We hope you learned something today. We hope you had some fun, and we hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange, where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.